ready, ready, <laughs> ready to go live. Yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm fine about that. The live streaming has now commenced, Chair, if you'd like to start the meeting. Uh, thank you, Hannah, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I know we all have papers and we can all hear and see everybody OK, but if any point through the meeting, people have difficulty, just raise your hand up in the comments and uh, I'll look at getting that sorted. Um, so item number one on the agenda, the Health and Wellbeing Board, is introduction and attendance at meeting. I uh, had a couple of apologies. Hannah, do you want to mention the apologies that we've received? Um, yep, so we've um, had apologies from Christine Shields, Assistant Director, Commissioning, Performance and Transformation. We've ha also had apologies from Posmic Volslaw, David Gallagher and Michael Horton from Tees Valley Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, but we've got Mark Pickering here uh, deputising. We've um, also had apologies from Mike Forster from Harrogate and District NHS Foundation Trust, uh, Carol Todd from uh, the, the College uh, and Alison Slater from NHS England. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have to go around and do um, a roll call over people. Would people like that? No, do you think? No, I don't think it's needed. I think my last time we went through this, didn't we? And we've got enough people here to be quiet, haven't we, Hannah? Yes, we do. Perfect, okay. Um, item number two, are there any declarations of interest? Uh, no, perfect. Um, so, so we've got a hand up from uh, hand up Michelle. Michelle. Hi, Sorry, Michelle. I was a bit slow off the mark there. Um, just my usual, I'm lay member for Tees Valley CCG as well as CEO of Healthwatch Darlington and I'm also a patient and public voice partner for NHS X. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Um, so item number three is to hear relevant representations from members of the public um, on items on the Health and Wellbeing Board. And I don't believe we've had any members of the public contact us um, Hannah, for questions on this agenda, is that right? No, nothing. Ah, perfect. Okay, so item number four, to approve the minutes of uh, this board, which are held on the 3rd of September and the 17th of December. Um, does anybody have any objections to those minutes? No? Um, Councillor Scott, are you going to second those so we can get them no then? I don't know if it's... <laughs> or somebody. Sorry, do you want them moved just to correct record? Yes, if that's possible. I know yes, I will certainly do that. do that, Mr <laughs> Chairman. Yes, sorry. Thank you. And um, if there aren't any objections, then, then those could be carried then. Perfect. It's always strange because although it's a formalised constituted board, it's very different from a constituted council committee where it's very strict about how you present and move reports and things. So uh, if there are no objections, then item number four there is carried, Hannah. Um, item number five is a presentation by the Director of Public Health, Penny, uh, who's going to take us through a presentation in relation to Darlington's response to um, COVID-19. So over to you, Penny, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's just see if I can do the technical bit. <laughs> Ooh, that one. You did it before the very beginning, so you were ahead then. <laughs> Right, can you see me? Um, no, we can see your presentation. Though, yes, is, uh, oh, that's, that's the important bit. So thank you. Um, I've lost all, all of your faces, so um, um, I'm just doing it to a presentation. So, well, last time um, we were together was in, in, um, in December, and at that time we were discussing the five tests which would uh, determine what tiering we're, we're in. But uh, a few months later, we're in quite a different situation. So we now have the four tests. Um, uh, test one, which is the vaccine deployment program, which continues that, that it continues successfully. Test two, evidence shows vaccines are sufficiently effective in reducing hospitalizations and deaths in those vaccinated. Test three, infection rates do not risk a surge in hospitalizations, which would put unsustainable pressure on the NHS. And finally, four, our assessment of the risks is not fundamentally changed by new variants of concern. 
So only when the government is sure that it's safe to move from one step to another will a final decision be made. And these decisions will be made on these four key tests. So we know that we came into this uh, th this current phase in the twenty uh, in the eighth of March, and we are moving closely to the twenty ninth of March, and uh, and hopefully we'll be having more opening ups of of various areas. So in terms of of the roadmap, the key points. Uh, there is a plan for restrictions to start to lift, but to ensure a safe exit from lockdown restrictions, we'll, we'll be using four steps with the restrictions being lifted across the whole of England at the same time. These steps will be informed by the data to avoid the risk in a surge of infections, hospitalizations and deaths. And there will be a minimum of five weeks between each step, four weeks for the data to reflect the changes, and for these to be analysed, followed by one week's advance notice for further easements. So um, as we move to um, the 29th of, eight, uh, of March, if we if we get through this situation, and so far we're doing pretty well in, in Darlington, um, that we've got, we have uh, increased social contact and business and activities. Um, and uh, we are still being encouraged to stay at home and there is no um, no opportunity for anybody to go on holiday at the time being and until it's we it's felt to be absolutely safe. Washing hands, face covering and and social distancing are still apart from the vaccine are still, the best way to protect ourselves from COVID-19 and uh, it's so important that we continue to do that and as a routine part of life not something in addition so these are so key. The stay at home, the stay at home campaign throughout all the stages of the roadmap a national campaign will continue to reinforce key messages for the public to maintain vigilance and the, and the campaign will cover topics such as safe behaviours, so following social distancing and not getting too close to anybody else. Ventilation, so if you're in if you're in the home, open windows if you can do, and always wear a face covering when appropriate. And we have now got the um, the stay at home campaign, which is again protecting the NHS. So we have gone back to that, saving lives. So these are a few um, uh, photographs from the campaign, which is encouraging people to open windows and protect, do everything we can to protect the NHS and save lives. And this other one, every day at home is making a difference. Every washed hand is making a difference. Every video call is making a difference and every covered face is making a difference. And as long as we do these actions, we, it, we will protect the most vulnerable in our population. It's very important. In terms of um, our Darlington situation report um, and the test one, is the vaccine deployment program continues successfully. And in Darlington, as of the 11th of March, 34,000, 489 vaccines have been given. 94% of all those aged 70 years have received their first dose of vaccine. Nine out of 10 residents in care homes have received their first dose of vaccine. And 37.14% of all adults of over six years old have had their first dose of vaccine. Uh, we have noticed, uh, been made aware that there is varies between different parts of Darlington. So, for example, in 24.48% in Darlington Central compared to 49.21% in Hammersnot. So there is a difference and we know that COVID has created a number of health inequalities that we are working very hard to address. So. Uh, we need to also understand why the difference is and whether it's because more people of our old age are in one area and, and not in another. So that is something that we're looking into and we'll be able to feed back to you shortly. 
The second doses of vaccines are starting this month, which is very positive. And our vaccination sites include Beatham's House, which is manned by our local GPs, the Mass Vaccination Centre at the Darlington Arena, and Cockerton Pharmacy at West Auckland Road. So we have three sites, which is, which is positive. In terms of the residents who have had um, a vaccine, as you can see, as I've mentioned earlier, Hummus Knot is doing particularly well. And if you go down to central Darlington, uh, not so well. Could be due to age profiles. It could be, as I said before, to a, a whole range of things, but we're going to be looking into that. So the average Darlington is 37.14%. In terms of test two, the evidence shows that vaccines are sufficiently effective in reducing hospitalizations and deaths in those vaccinated. And as we can see, um, there have been 21 COVID emergency admissions the week ending of the 9th of March. And we can see it goes in the, in the graphs going nicely down and hospital beds occupied by COVID-19 and suspected COVID-19, non-COVID-19, and unoccupied, as you can see, uh, it's 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 very low compared to how it has been previously. So that again is a positive for the next phase. Uh, test three: infection rates do not risk a surge in hospitalizations, which would put unsustainable pressure on the NHS. Now this goes back to to to, to January, so it's not the most up to date data that we have, but we can see with the dark blue lines that that um, it's less than the five-year average. So that is something that is particularly helpful. Case detection rate over the over 60s, the rates in those over 60 in Darlington have increased from the end of December, but at a much slower rate than those under 60 and remain lower than those under the 60 rate overall. So you can see if the, the lighter blue is the rate of cases from 0 to 19, and the, the darker blue is rate cases age 60, and you can see that's coming down really nicely. And again, whoops. The and and again in the seven-day case rate, you can see um, early in January it was quite high, and now it's actually gone incredibly low. So that again is positive for Darlington. The percentage of the new um, positive lab samples with a new uh, S gene target failure, as you can see in Darlington, 98.2% 90, of our cases, uh, our positive cases, are due to the variant uh, Kent. We, we called it the, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's, it's the normal one presently uh, for the whole of the UK, but in, in Darlington, uh, 98 percent, 98 point, sorry, 2 percent of our cases are due to the Kent variant. In terms of our local testing, we have um, our cumulative totals for Darlington. So in terms of the PCR tests, uh, a total total individuals tested of 53,510, people tested positive 7,183, and people who tested negative 46,327. And looking at the lateral flow testing, the community testing which started in Darlington um, on the 14th of December, I've got uh, uh, more of a, a, an update around this. So we've had 25, 215 cases in total. And out of our, our asymptomatic cases, we have found 364 positive asymptomatic cases. And that is um, really good news because these are people who don't have any symptoms and would be happily just walking around not knowing that they were contagious. So that is a, a really good result for Darlington. The school-based testing for staff and pupils, 26,288 total tests. Total tested positively 19 and totally te total tested is 
negatively is 26,269. So again, that's positive. So in terms of our PCR and lateral flow testing, what you can see is um, from the beginning of March, uh, the PCR reducing to a degree, then coming back up and then down. But but the but the the really uh, substantial uh, graph is the, uh, the the lateral flow tests, which has literally been going up and up and up. Uh, we've got up to the 14th of March, so that has been a phenomenal response and um, and uh, very good for Darlington. In addition, the uh, Department of Health and Social Care are also um, are, are currently planning an ex expansion of opportunities for testing in the coming weeks. And these are including the Community Collect, which enables um, residents to uh, access their, their um, tests and take the test at, at home and this is probably the way forward is we will be doing an awful lot of testing and most of it will be done at home institutional testing targeting large larger employers of over 50 employees will be able to also enable to undertake testing in their own workplace and of course the school's home testing parents are provided with test kits to take home and undertake tests at home prior to, to going to school and all of all of these three developments are to protect people and to enable us to target effectively. So in terms of COVID-19 recovery, we are hopefully moving out of COVID to a certain degree. And it's really important that we prepare for recovery. So we have been working with our colleagues in the Northeast to look at how we would to look at some frameworks for the Northeast. And what we intend to do for Darlington is to then do something specific for our for our population, for our residents. So we know that COVID-19 has presented a, a unique opportunity to further incorporate health, well-being inequalities and the wider determinants of health within our local strategic approaches, such as developing a, a, a recovery framework. And it also opposite, uh, offers the opportunity to align this with a public health approach and with other agendas, such as economic recovery and climate change. And um, public health have started to do some work looking at recovery plans and analyzing them so that we can perhaps pick and choose some key points that will help us to do our own recovery work. We know that during COVID, we have seen some disparities uh, between various groups, various populations, and that there is a need for, for doing some leveling up. So in the Northeast, they, uh, a health inequality impact assessment has been done, which will help us to identify our own population. We can look, at, we can look at the existing frameworks, and we might find that they're perhaps not exactly what we need. Because at the end of the day, we need to we need to make sure that our most vulnerable have the best outcomes that they can. So some of the areas, some of the vulnerable groups that we're concerned about it's quite a it's quite a it's quite a list so it includes people living in care homes older people people with underlying health conditions people who are shielding our BAME communities people living with substance misuse people working in high-risk occupations people who are sleeping rough sex workers people living in multi occupancy I can't say that word occupancy households overcrowded households and we have people whose first language is not English. The Gypsy Roma traveling groups, the asylum seeker ref, ref, refuge groups, vulnerable children and young people, people who are victims of domestic abuse, low income families, people who are employed and or living in economic insecurity. Economic people living with disabilities and people living with sensory impairments and people living with a, a learning disability. These are 
population groups that we really need to focus on so that we can get the flourishing communities back in Darlington as we move out of COVID. I've, I've included um, Marmot's um, key principles, which I think are really important in the way that we move forward to our recovery. So it's the best start in life and we can consider investment in childcare settings, digital, digital inclusion. Now that is a really important one because it's so important if you, if you are wanting, for example, to, to book your NHS vaccination, not everybody in Darlington has, is digitally um, savvy. So that is something that we probably do need to have a consideration about early years development and school readiness as well. Maximising capabilities, we need to consider, again, antisocial behaviour, inequalities in educational attainment and life learn op opportunities for learning. Creating fair employment, we need to consider inequalities in work and in pay, the role of the anchor institutions and employer standards. A healthy standard of living, we can consider the impact of the built environment on health, the root causes of pov poverty, proportionate universalism, and sustainable and healthy places, considering aligning health and climate change, affordable and sustainable housing, upscaling active travel, and finally, ill health prevention, consider all health in all policies, in everyone's responsibility, the capacity of the public health system and strate st strategies with named accountability for them. Now, I know the short time I've been in Darlington, that Darlington works together incredibly well, and this will be on many people's um, radar already, but it's just to highlight and for the record that we will be doing everything that we can to ensure that as we come out of COVID, we do the best for our for our populations. Um, in terms, and, and one of the things I'm particularly keen on is um, asset-based approaches. So looking at a positive way of addressing issues rather than um, taking a deficit, which is what is looking bad and trying to make it better. It's what is good and trying to make it better. So that was a, a, a quick run through. If anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, uh, Penny. I think you can um, stop sharing your screen now. Um, <laughs> just... Perfect. And before I open up to some questions, um, thank you for that um, presentation, Penny. It was, it was very useful. I, I do just want to make um, a quick comment um, in relation to the unhelpful headline by the Northern Echo today um, relating to the um, surge in cases for Darlington. And I just wanted to give some narrative around uh, you know, as, as health professionals, we probably all know, um, you know, we look at the data regularly and I think, um, you know, to define what's happened in the last week as a surge would be, um, you know, wouldn't be how we would define it, I guess. You know, we, we've had an increase of 35 cases in Darlington over the last week, um, which we attribute to, uh, you know, the movement between um, young people and Penny could explain a little bit more on that. But I am, you know, really pleased with how Darlington has been working in relation to COVID over the last uh, four or five months, you know, from if we look at October up until March, um, Darlington's trajectory of COVID hasn't, um, you know, hasn't peaked as high for as long um, as, as most other comparable Tees Valley local authorities, and I think that's to be celebrated. It's, um, you know, our, our population uh, do a fantastic um, job at, at, at sticking to the guidelines uh, in very difficult circumstances. I mean, Harlepool, for example, has had a difficult time. They've seen their per hundred thousand. Uh, jumped to near 750. Um, you know, I think Middlesbrough has been in a similar position in the high 800s per 100,000. And Darwin's never really been in that position. Uh, so I think sometimes when we, um, you know, when we look at this data, we've got to look at the data as a whole. Um, and I know Penny and the team and the council have worked very, very hard with testing. We've done, as of today, over 25,000 lateral flow tests, which have identified hundreds of people who wouldn't have ordinar ordinarily have known they had COVID, which is uh, been really fantastic and we in fact along with the vaccination program got recognised by the health secretary for the really great pioneering work that's happening in Darlington 
Um, so I just wanted to you know, comment on that part of the presentation, Penny, and I'll open it up to some questions. Does anybody have any questions of Penny or in general to do with that? So I'm just looking if there's any comments. I can't see anybody, that's fine, so we can move on. I know that Councillor Hart, nice. Uh, I knew, I knew, I knew Councillor Hart, you have a question and you weren't like, you know, uh, yeah, how, uh, um, by all means, I'll ask your question. Thank you. I was given the opportunity for the outside people to step in first. Um, it was, if I made three questions on the presentation that you just gave, um, Penny, which was uh, very informative. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of, uh, you had a slide which just, um, gave the number of LFT tests that have been given to the wider population and also the school population. I didn't quite catch what you said. The figures were roughly comparable. It's around 24, 25,000 for both the wider population and the school's population. And I know because I've got a daughter in secondary school that that presumably means for the school one, it was the number of tests given because it's too many for the number of secondary school children in Darlington and it, dividing it by three because that's roughly how many she's had. It equates to 8,000 um, secondary school children. So were both figures tests given as opposed to people who have participated? Because I'm curious with the, the wider population as to exactly how many people have had tests rather than how many tests have been given, i.e. are people going just once or are we getting a large body of people that are going on a regular basis? And that's really why I'm asking what that figure means. Um, so that, that was the first question that I had. Thank you, Chair. Right. Um, in, in in response to um, to your question, um, I think it's because people can people can test at home, and they don't always then send the um, the test re recover back through. So it is difficult in terms of absolutely gauging it in an act in a, like an exact science. However. We, you know, we have, um, we have got, we have certainly from our our dolphin testing and our local testing sites, we can we can uh, we can identify because when we've we've tested them, they then if it's a positive, it will go through to test and trace. So, um, but I think um, it, it's it's still an, an evolving process. But I think what I can say is that um, I haven't got the the exact numbers in my head at present. Uh, but what I can say is that um, in the next next months, maybe even next years, that, that lateral flow tests will be with us for quite a long time. Um, and um, and so the more people we can encourage to to, to test and to, and to get comfortable doing it, the better. Um, thanks, Penny. Just 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 on that, Councillor Harper. Sorry, I know you probably want to come back. I'm not too up to date on the measures that the schools are taking, and, and that's that 600 different um, responsibilities. But what I can say, in terms of the 25,000 lateral flow tests that have been undertaken, around 28% of people are return customers, should we say. And um, so, although we will have undertaken around 25,000 tests themselves, that will be 25,000 individual sessions for individual people. And um, it's likely to be less than that because of the number of people who return. But I can get you that detail. Uh, we know which wards, which areas, and um, you know, um, types of genders, ethnicities of people going into the um, test centres. But around 30%, 28% of the last look were people who had rebooked uh, and a follow up test, if that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's what I was trying to understand is, is what mm. proportion of those 25,000 yeah. tests are people that are going back on a regular basis? Because my understanding is that's the point of it is that yeah. people at risk need to do it on a regular basis. And if they're not doing that, then we're missing the message about what, yeah. what the point of those those tests is. And hence, that's why I was asking. In terms of, um, I think this is an important point in, in your presentation, talking about the demonstrating that the vaccine is being effective. It, it, I just wanted to understand a bit more about how that's been done in terms of demonstrating that it is effective. I'm not suggesting for one minute it isn't because I fully believe it is. But is it being done purely on the basis of looking at the, the number of um, COVID admissions into hospitals? Or is work being done to actually identify? So someone goes into hospital, are they, for instance, being checked that they've had a vaccine and when that was and making actually a causal link between 
the vaccine being rolled out and whether individuals who've had the vaccine are then appearing in hospital or not or is it just purely on the basis that the numbers are falling and therefore the assumption is it must be because the vaccine um, is being rolled out and the reason I asked the question is because you know sadly in the community there's a lot of people that are suspicious about the vaccine and not taking it for a whole, whole host of reasons and that's amplified by the other slide you had where in Darlington Central I think it was around 25% take up and in Hermes Knots 50% so there's a vast difference and if we can get a strong message out and demonstrate that there's a clear link between the vaccine and falling cases of it, it hopefully will reassure some people who are fearful of the vaccine and are not taking it in the same way that we've got in a sorry state over MNR, people choosing not to take it for you know all the wrong reasons. And hence the question about what, what what would is 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 the link being demonstrated as a causal link, or is it just an observation that admissions are falling, and therefore it must be something to do with the vaccine? I, I think that what we started with the oldest group, so the eighty plusers, um, and we're doing it in ages because that is the that is the the most Im, Im, important way that we can do that uh, to protect our population. So we've already done ninety four percent of the over 70s and and we are working our way down but there is a there, there is always concern about people who might be hesitant about the vaccine and we're trying to change the language to get people to be confident about the vaccine because it is really important and and of those people who who have who have had their vaccine so far that is the first dose so we need to make sure that we that those people who've had the first dose go for their second do dose when they've been invited for it, because that is really important as well. And so we have, and in terms of the council, and I would say the 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 NHS system, that that a lot of work has been done to encourage people to take the vaccine, um, because it is, uh, you know, life saving not just for the individual but for those people around them as well. So so I think. We're doing it in a particular order, and it's it's the it's the order that it should be done. But there is a concern that as as it as it gets more and more towards younger people, they may, they may be less likely to take it up. But I've got lots of clever people in the in the um, in, in the group that might be able to add something to it. But from my perspective, you know, we 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 need to do everything we can to roll out the vaccine, and we need to use positive language that will encourage people to be okay and to be confident about having the vaccine because that is our way out of COVID. Perfect, thank you very much Penny. Um, do you have any further follow-up questions, Councillor Harker? Um, no, I just said I had three and the, the last two were wrapped up in that same uh, question, so thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Are there any further questions from anybody in relation to that item? No, perfect. <coughs> Okay, we'll move on to item number six, um, and it's the Darlington Carers Action Plan for 2020-2022. I always get my numbers mixed like so. up. Um, and it's a report by the Director of Children and Adult Services, I believe, James, is it yourself? Hi, Chair. Lisa Holdsworth, see you to talk to it, Chair. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Got your name on it, that's all. Yeah, and my name's on a lot of them. Same. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Lisa Holdsworth, Commissioning Officer, uh, talking to the Carers Action Plan report. Um, just really to the purpose of the report is to raise the profile of carers in Darlington and to seek the support of members in terms of supporting that role. Um, you'll have seen from the report that there is um, obviously quite a lot of information in the report around the numbers of carers that are in Darlington. The numbers that we have are obviously from the last census, which was 11,000. Um, obviously, the new census is coming up now, and that will give us more up-to-date information about the numbers of carers in Darlington. Alongside that, we know about the carers that are known through our carers support services, uh, one for carers of adults and for parents of disabled children, and one for young carers up to the age of 25. And those are the services that we commission uh, through the council and through the CCG in terms of supporting carers in Darlington. Um, 
You'll see from the report, obviously, there was a National Carers Action Plan that was due for an update, which has been delayed for a number of reasons. But obviously what we wanted to do in Darlington was to keep our momentum and to ensure that we're continuing to support our carers. Um, it's fairly clear from the drive that's going through that the profile of carers has been raised through the pandemic due both to the ongoing work that carers have taken on caring for people that they were caring for before the pandemic and also from carers who've taken on increased caring roles as the pandemic's progressed. For some of those carers, it's people who have been working from home and have their caring role has increased because they're actually with the carer, with the person they're caring for all the time. For other people, it's arisen because of increased needs as a result of people ca catching uh, COVID. Um, we've initially there was a num there was a reduction in the number of carers who were coming through for support through the carer support services and through young carers. That was at the point I was writing the report. That's actually increased quite, so quite considerably now, particularly with the rollout of the vaccine to carers and carer support services are in, taking increasing numbers of referrals. I think it's actually a real positive because not only are carers able to access the vaccine, but also it will give us a legacy in terms of carers being known to health and social care systems because carers quite often are reluctant to come forward and identify themselves as carers or don't even see themselves in that role. But I think the pandemic has enabled people to see that. So I think a really positive legacy in terms of uh, people identifying themselves as carers and being more aware of what that means for them and the support that they might receive. Um, our action plan is set out in a number of areas. One is services and systems that work for carers. One is employment and financial well-being. And there's a great increase in the number of carers who are both working and caring. A clear section on young carers, section on recognising and supporting carers in the wider community, and also in building research and evidence to improve outcomes for carers. I'm not proposing going through the action plan in great detail because obviously it's there for people to see and to look at. Um, so what I would suggest if people are happy is if people have any questions to ask, specific questions to ask, be more than happy to answer them. Uh, perfect. Thanks so much, Lisa, for that. Um, are there any questions for Lisa? Oh, Councillor Scott? Yes, yes. just um, a couple of comments. Obviously, I'm pleased to hear you say that carers are coming forward for support because I noticed um, particularly with the bereavement, the cruise bereavement, that, you know, people were reluctant to do that. And I think Michelle said on behalf of Health Watch that people were not very comfortable about doing that by Zoom. And I can understand that, isn't it? You know, if you want in bereavement support, you really want it face to face. And just another comment on the success of the Darlow Millions. And I mean, that's something that we are looking at very closely to put more money into that, because I think that has been a great success. Um, so there's lots of positives in this. Um, and we just have to be here, don't we, to support the carers as much as we possibly can through these very difficult times. So that's just a general comment, really. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, any further questions for Lisa? No, perfect. Yeah. Jay, uh, Lisa Jen, it's just to receive this report, it's not to be approved or voted on, is it? Well, it's just to receive it and to be yeah. mindful of the, the needs of carers. Yeah, thank you. I just think some um, technical expert in six months' time would say it was never approved. Um, but uh, no, it was just there to enable that. So thank you very much. Okay, so next. So, Chair, it does, it does the, it is recommended that members endorse the action plan and members are asked, uh, recommended that they act as champions for carers and consider how to support progress of the agenda in Darlington. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, Councillor Scott, anyone to second it for me? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Yes, um, yes, that's fine. <laughs> So, do we have any objections to supporting this um, report? No? So that is carried. I hate the formalities of council. Sorry. Um, I'm the wrong job. 
Um, okay, so item item number seven is any supplementary items, which in the opinion of the chair, um, we can discuss. And I believe, Councillor Scott, you have something to discuss as a supplementary item, which I'll let, I'll let you know on this occasion. <laughs> um, it's it's not strictly speaking a supplementary item, but it is something. It was agreed at the cabinet meeting last week that we would ask the Health and Wellbeing Board to investigate um, the um, the issue of takeaways and the effect that it has on the health of people. I think the planning committee are very concerned that they would like um, supplementary planning. Um, law to be introduced but as i understand it we've got the evidence to do it now i know it's been a very short time between cabinet and the health and well-being board um, i would like to ask the indulgence of the committee to ask that the health and well-being board do start this work and that you can give us a report back at the next meeting i think it, it's an issue that that is causing concern but as i say to change the planning law, we have to have the evidence. So mm -hmm. I would just ask the committee um, to agree that that work can start. Thank you, uh, Councillor Scott. And um, yeah, I think um, I think everyone would agree. I think it's something worth looking into. And um, I think with with all of the caveats that I've mentioned before around you know the location around the you know holistic approach to health and well-being, you know, and, and as long as it, in my view, isn't you know, singularly focused on on one particular thing because I think we look at you know takeaways in food as as one example of how you know people's well-being and health can be affected and it can be a multifaceted uh, approach and I think if um, if if we can all maybe look uh, at our own sort of feedback as what we can bring maybe at the next board we can mail something out about any any sort of evidence or any any um, information that we could bring particularly from young people as well I think Michelle you know from um, you know people from your youth health watch talking about actually how um, you know fast food affects them because I know there are a lot of young people who are health conscious as well who use takeaways which are quite healthy I mean there's one next door which is called Fit Fresh I don't know how fresh it is and I'm not making any um, I'm not um, you know supporting any particular business I've just thought that uh, but I guess there are takeaways that are healthy as well and uh, so I guess it's um, it's about that balance that I think getting young people particularly involved uh, because it's their future as well and their present I guess it's the decision that they make um, day to day that affects um, them in the future and everybody else so yeah I think we'll get something together and maybe all bring something for next time um, and um, yeah so Michelle, give me your hand up. Yeah, it's just so that you're aware, this has come at a really good time that um, the, our Youth Watch volunteers, um, their next project is healthy eating and well-being anyway. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, we'll be able to definitely contribute to that. And um, they're, they're currently putting together a project, which is um, little seed boxes and well-being boxes that they're making themselves. And then it's going to be for, I think it's three to... 12 year olds so it's a uh, you know first come first served sort of thing but um yeah you you'll be hearing about that next time um and hopefully it'll be a success as well that'd be fab and also just quickly on a point have you or did you did you agree to do your voice recording for the town center message Yes. <laughs> so, so for those who don't know there's a speaker in the town center and um, giving covid messages um, and I don't know the lady who recorded the message in about keeping safe and reminding people, but it's fine, I like it, it's a fine message. But we've decided to shake it up with some familiar voices of young people and people who are, uh, you know, well known. And Michelle's one of those voices who's going to be getting blared out in the town centre. So I bet, um, uh, you know, partner and kids will be not happy about hearing her <laughs> voice all over town as well. But I just thought I'd check. So thanks for doing that. They didn't ask me or or Councillor Scott or Councillor Harker for some reason, I'm not sure why, but uh, never mind. <laughs> um, are there any further questions? They probably hear my voice too often. Well, I'm saying that's nothing. That's probably why. Um, perfect. Are there any further questions on that particular item? Perfect. And are there any general questions of anybody? Any comments? Sorry, Penny's got her hand up. Oh, she. Penny? Might be a, I'm hiding in the corner. Sorry, I just wanted to say that I'm more than happy to take a lead on on this pro on this program, and uh, we'll convene a small group to take it forward. Oh, that'd be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. Um, and are there any any further questions in in, in general? Does anybody have any comments? No. Perfect. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We're all very busy people, and uh, particularly Amanda. 
vaccinating. So thank you for all your help, Amanda, and uh, thank, thank you everybody for all your hard work over the last few weeks and months. And hopefully we'll, we'll get through it um, into the summer. So thank you all very much and see you next time.